Satan desired to have you all, said the Lord Jesus, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. We're going to begin by singing a great hymn of the faith attributed to Columba. It comes from the 6th century, number 289. Christ is the world's redeemer, the holy and the pure, the fount of heavenly wisdom, our trust and hope secure. 289. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, how gladly we bow before you together this morning, gathered as we are into your presence through your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, to call upon you, our Father, our Father in heaven. One God in three persons, the perfect Trinity. And we praise you, O God, our great Redeemer, who has indeed, through your Son, our full redemption won, rescuing us through his great triumph over all the powers of darkness, so that we might have a new life, a new future, a new joy, and a secure hope that will never, ever fail us. How we praise you, our gracious God, for the depths of your great, great mercy, which stoops so low, 
suffering even for the chiefest of sinners, that such as we might know the wonder of your abundant love, the depth of the love of your heart. Help us, Lord, we pray, to understand it. Help us to take in what it meant for you, the Holy One, to take away our sin and what it cost you that we should be sheltered from, from the judgment of your righteous and holy wrath, sheltered only by the blood of Christ, our Passover lamb, the one who was ransomed for us, to ransom us from the futility, from the folly of our own selfishness, our own self-will, our own self-rule, and saved for the sincerity and the truth of your everlasting kingdom of light. Lord, we pray, make us in our hearts and in our lives, in all that we are, make us treasure your gospel of hope above all earthly things, all earthly loves, and every ambition of our hearts. Make us treasure it today and always, we pray. And so, Lord, we beseech thee, Grant thy people grace to withstand the temptations of the world and the flesh and the devil and with pure hearts and minds follow thee the only God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm uh, welcome indeed to all of you this morning, very especially if you're visiting with us and uh, if it's your first time here with us at the Tron, whether you're upstairs and I can see you or whether you're downstairs and I hope you can see and hear all right now, uh, then you're very welcome indeed. Just one or two notices. You have a sheet like this, I think, uh, on your seat or somewhere near and uh, let me highlight one or two things. You'll see in the middle there is uh, the sheet about our harvest offering. Today is the last day for our harvest offering, which, as you'll see, is for the work of the Delhi Bible Institute, one of our partner uh, missions in India. And uh, so uh, this morning or this evening, uh, if you would put your gifts marked for that uh, in the offertory, and uh, we shall make sure that we uh, gather all that in. Next Sunday evening, I'll be traveling to Delhi uh, for a week of teaching there, and it would be great if I can uh, take with them the news of our contribution towards this latest venture for them. So I commend that warmly to you. Uh, you'll see that uh, we have uh, our evening service this evening at 6.30 as usual. Rupert will be finishing his uh, excellent series on the book of Hosea. I'm sure you won't want to miss that. And then of course for our Farsi speakers, we'll be downstairs uh, with our own studies also. So please do join us again this evening. Uh, you'll see also on the right hand side, if you look at the sheets here, that uh, this coming week on Wednesday, we have a very important church family meeting. Please do make every effort to uh, join us and be with us if you possibly can. We're going to be talking about important and uh, indeed exciting developments in the life of our church as we look to uh, begin a new congregation or perhaps even more than one uh, in the city here over this coming year. And uh, we'd love for you to be here to hear about that, to know how to pray and uh, it's something that's going to involve all of us as a congregation, every one of us, uh, stepping up to new responsibilities perhaps, new commitments, and uh, new partnership in our life of service together. So please uh, make Wednesday evening a real priority uh, if you possibly can. I'll leave you to read the rest of the notices. Do do that and uh, take note of them. There are lots of things there that will involve different people. But uh, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading. Uh, which is, in fact, in Luke chapter 22. Not chapter 23, as it says on the sheet. That was my mistake. But uh, chapter 22, you'll find it on page 881 if you have uh, one of our church visitors' Bibles. And uh, we're now into the very last act of Luke's great gospel drama, the very final stage 
in the road to glory that Jesus has been walking with his disciples uh, since the turning point in Luke's gospel back in, in chapter 9, verse 51. Do you remember there we were told that uh, the hour was near for Jesus to be taken up, that is, taken up into the glory of heaven. And so he set his face resolutely towards uh, Jerusalem because the road to glory for Christ must lead through the cross at Jerusalem. And so all the action in this last section uh, is around Jerusalem. And we saw at chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus' first entry into the city of Jerusalem. We call that the triumphal entry. And uh, he sent two disciples ahead of him to borrow a colt uh, for Jesus to ride on. And we read there, remember, that they went ahead and they found it just as Jesus had told them. And now we'll see at the beginning of chapter 22 that uh, we have a repeat pattern exactly. Jesus sends two disciples on ahead of him. Uh, this time to find a room to borrow for eating the Passover. And uh, as we'll see, exactly the same. They found it just as Jesus told them. That's one of Luke's uh, markers. It's, it's the equivalent of old-fashioned uh, bold print. They didn't have that in the days of old scribal manuscripts like we have today. But it's like a big heading saying, look at this. I'm telling you something. This is very carefully ordered. So let's read then uh, from Luke chapter 22 at verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officials how he might uh, betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him some money. And so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I might eat the Passover with my disciples? And he'll show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute also rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater? One who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign, I covenant to you as my Father has covenanted to me a kingdom. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 
Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you all, that he might sift you all like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And he said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, that's enough. Amen. May God bless us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing again now number 396 in our books that speaks of the nature of the king who came as a helpless babe to serve that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. Number 396.
Well, now, as the musicians play and we have a few moments of quiet, our offerings for the Lord's work uh, will be received. You might like to read over again these words in Luke's Gospel that we'll be studying shortly. Uh, But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. Let us pray together. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lord, lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. We come, Lord, before you with the needs of this, the world that you created upon our hearts and in our minds. As today we constantly hear of events the world over pertaining to the power and the authority of rulers, their decisions, their policies, their actions that affect not only their own lands but in our ever more interconnected world, affecting the lives of all right across this world. I think this week of the visit, the state visit to our nation, of the president of that great vast land of China, the world's second greatest economy, growing so fast, developing so quickly, so vast in population and increasing in power and wealth and influence across the globe. We pray, Lord, for that nation, for its leaders, for a system that is not free and perhaps oversees many concerns of human rights and of freedom for its people. And yet, Lord, is so significant and increasingly so in its relations with all governments and rulers. We give you great thanks for the wonderful encouragement that we have in the great growth also of the Church of Jesus Christ in the land of China. Thinking back as we were just the other week to 150 years of the work and the witness of first the China Inland Mission and now the Overseas Missionary Fellowship to that land and many others 
in Southeast Asia, how we praise and thank you for all that you have been doing and are doing in that great land today. We pray for your church in China, for every Christian believer there, that through their life and godliness, they might be witnesses to the light and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the goodness and the truth that flows from faith in him, and to the health and prospering of human society that comes as an inevitable consequence where the truth and the integrity and the honesty of life in the way of the Lord Jesus is lived out before men. We thank you, Lord, for the recognition in that land that to do business with those who are Christian is a good thing because they can be trusted not to deceive, not to defraud, but to be true to their word and to their bond. We pray, Lord, for an ever-increasing influence of the lives of Christians in that great land and that from there so also might come mission of the gospel to other parts of the world. How we thank you, Lord, that it is true today that there are so many parts of the world where decades, even centuries ago, people took the gospel from the West and where now that gospel is living and growing and flourishing even as we grieve to see the West so greatly turning its back upon the gospel which truth laid the very foundations of the prosperity of our society. But we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign, that you are all-knowing, that nothing that you do is without plan or purpose for good. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be at work even in lands that seem closed to the gospel of Christ, that you would be calling to yourself, men and women and boys and girls, those who know and love the Lord Jesus, to follow him and to serve him, not like the world, but showing the upside-down values of your great kingdom of grace in the midst of a world of darkness and strife and disarray. We thank you, Lord, for the land of India, again, that vast country with so many people. And we pray very particularly again for the work of the Delhi Bible Institute and all of its associated satellites. We pray, Lord, for this appeal and for our part in it. You might take and multiply that which we can give into your service. They might be used for the growth of your church, for the increase of the gospel, for the encouragement of many throughout the states of North India. We pray, Lord, for our own nation, in days of political upheaval, of so many issues to be decided and thought upon, more referendum questions coming up with the European Union, more turmoil constitutionally in our own parliament. So many things, Lord, that of themselves might lead us to despair. And yet, we are so glad that you have opened our eyes to the truth and the light above this world, to the knowledge that nothing can take place in this world or in our lives, but that you have determined, you have decreed. We thank you, Lord, that we do worship a God who is truly sovereign, in whose hands all the issues of time and eternity truly do belong, and that though so often these things are hidden from our frail mortal eyes, our knowledge of you tells us and reminds us constantly that we know you to be a God who is faithful, God who will not turn his face away from his people, a God who hears and answers prayers, a God who is near to help, to succor, to strengthen, that our faith may not fail. So, Lord, we pray for ourselves as we gather here today as a company of your people. We pray 
for our church family, that you would strengthen us, that our faith would not fail. Help us, Lord, in this coming week as we meet together to consider the future and to consider all that we believe that you are calling us to and leading us into in the coming year ahead. Guard us and keep us in our hearts, we pray. Remind us that the devil does demand to have us, that he is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, seeking where he may sow discord, discontent in the hearts of even your people, that he might set one against the other, that he might lead us in the way not of the kingdom but of the world, wanting our will to lord it over others, to be the very antithesis of the servanthood of our servant king. Lord, you have guarded and kept us in recent months and years through so many dangers, toils, and snares. How we thank you and praise you for all that through which we have already come. Now we pray in days of peace and settlement that you would guard us also from the enemy within. Keep our eyes, we pray, mindful of our enemy, but always upon our great God and Savior, by whose intercession alone we can be kept strong, and walking in his hand alone can we be kept in the way of righteousness and peace and love to God and love to one another. So, Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that once again today you would shed fresh light from it into our souls to lead us, every one, but above all, to lead us together as one people, knowing you and loving you and following you more nearly every day of our lives. We need you, Lord. We are so weak, so frail, so vulnerable to the attentions of evil. So come to us, we pray. Guard our hearts and turn our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ who died and who is risen and who comes again in glory. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Before we come to God's word then, we sing the song on the screen. See, he dies as a lowly man of sorrows.
Well, do turn with me, if you would, to Luke 22 and uh, page 881 in the Church Bibles. Christ, our Passover Lamb. Jesus' first entry uh, into Jerusalem that we've already looked at came with maximum publicity. He proclaimed himself openly and his coming kingdom as uh, a sovereign come to reign. He is the Lion of Judah, long foretold, come at last, uh, as promised. But this second entry to Jerusalem is quite different. It's quiet, it's hidden, as Jesus comes actually to inaugurate his kingdom as a savior come to redeem. Because although a king, he is also the Lamb of God, long foreshadowed, but now at last come to take away forever the sins of his people according to God's covenant promise. And at the heart of the story lies this great unfathomable paradox that the sovereign announces his coming at last of his long-awaited kingdom, his glorious reign, and yet he is despised and rejected by his very own people. And yet, through that very rejection... He becomes the Savior who accomplishes his great redemption of all his people of faith throughout all the world. In other words, the suffering of Jesus at the hands of cruel and wicked men and at the dark powers of Israel is not a mistake. It's not a tragic failure. In fact, it's nothing less than the eternally planned and purposed means of God's redemption of his people. It's been foreshadowed and prophesied all through Israel's history, above all in the Passover, which brought about the great deliverance from the bondage of Egypt into the promised land of God's sovereign rule and God's care. And all that the Passover foreshadowed so eloquently is now to be fulfilled ultimately. First of all, in in pregnant symbol in Jesus' Last Supper with the disciples, in the broken bread and the poured out wine. But then, of course, in his personal suffering at the cross, in his broken body and his shed blood. And that's why Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed to deliver us from the malice and evil into the sincerity and the truth of life in the kingdom of God. So let's look at uh, what Luke emphasizes for us in this account as it unfolds in three movements. First of all, the events that precede the Passover, then the explanation during the supper itself, and then the discussion that takes place with the disciples afterwards. And you'll see that in each narrative, there's an emphasis on the inevitability of everything that happens. So verse 7, the Passover had to be sacrificed. Verse 13, it happened just as Jesus told them. His word is fulfilled. And verse 22, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. So verse 37 and 38, the scripture must be fulfilled in Jesus. All that is written about me has its fulfillment. That's very clear, isn't it? What we're being told is that Luke is narrating events that will prove to be nothing less than the culmination and the climax of the whole story of human history, indeed of divine history. That which the scriptures have unfolded since the very beginning of time. Now make no mistake just what a, what a great claim is being made here. These events are about nothing less than the key to history, indeed the key to eternity. That's a bold claim. It may be that uh, uh, you've never been here before, never been to church before, and perhaps never even really engaged with uh, the Christian message before. Uh, and maybe you consider it, well, rather an indifferent matter. Let me just say this morning to you, if that's the case, that just can't be so. Either the Christian message is to be dismissed as untrue, without any real foundation, in which case it's not just trivial, actually, it's dangerous folly. 
Either that, or if it is true, if the historical Jesus is to be credited with any real truth, then this is the most important issue in the world and for every single human being in the world today. So let's look at uh, Luke's words concerning Jesus. First of all, in verses 1 to 13, Luke wants us to grasp the truth about the real presence of Satan, the real presence of Satan and Christ's sovereignty over all things. And his message is clear. The dark power of Satan, although real and terrible, cannot derail the determined plan of God. Judas is under Satan's control, but it is Jesus who exhibits complete sovereign control. His word is directing everything down to the very last detail. As verse 13 says, all will be just as he has told them. Verse 1 tells us that the Passover is approaching, the greatest of uh, Israel's festivals that spoke about that great redemption of the Exodus and celebrated the salvation of of a great redeemer God. But what a height of irony. Look at verse 2. The very chief priests and scribes who taught the people in the temple about these things were seeking to put to death the redeemer himself in the person of God's son. Now that's no surprise, of course. We've read time and again that they want to kill him. Just look back to chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, and you'll see. They were being inhibited thus far because of the fear of the people. But now we're told they feared so much his influence over the people that they just must have him dead before he could win them over completely. So great was their, their perversity and their wickedness. But verse 3, if you look, explains the sheer vitriol of their hearts. And it points us to the sinister and horrific reality of evil. It points us to a world that we shudder even to contemplate, the domain of Satan. Because behind every human wickedness lies the dark power of the devil himself. And he can and he does influence and even drive and control the behavior and the actions of human beings in this world. We're told here that Satan entered into Judas himself. Evil is real. And Satan is real. And his horrible and ugly darkness is manifest in this world in the perversity of the minds and hearts of human beings and their behavior in this world. That's what this means. Now, again, many people today find that very difficult to believe and contemplate. But friends, this is not, let me say, just a matter of uh, something primitive and, uh, and superstitious. We've seen all the way through Luke's gospel how Luke, who was a physician, is very careful uh, in his analysis. Yes, he has given us instances of demonic possession, but he has also carefully differentiated those from other illnesses, ordinary illnesses and disease. We saw that back in chapter 4, for example. In fact, Luke is reporting these demonic episodes because they are so unusual and because they seem to be directly related to the ministry of Jesus, as if Jesus' presence is what draws out these manifestations of the dark powers of evil, just because of who Jesus really is. It is his presence in the world that signifies a great cosmic conflict coming to its climax, coming to its denouement. So it's not just that in these, uh, in these primitive times, simple people thought like that, and, and nowadays we know better. We can explain all these things just by you know, mental illness or something. Not at all. Luke is not a naive fool. He was a sophisticated, educated man. As, in fact, our doctors today, you go to any GP and ask them, and they will tell you very clearly that they can tell the difference between patients they know are mad and patients they know are just bad. Ask any policeman, he can tell you that too. Our modern world loves to explain everything away as though it was just merely a a scientific matter of genes or a, a, a social matter, poverty or whatever it is. But you see, deep down, we know that doesn't work, don't we? That's why it's no surprise that uh, our newspaper headlines so often can't help but use that language of evil. 
and of darkness and of devils. Sheer evil is the headline above multiple reports of a, a, a terrible rapist. Devils, the headline about abusers of children, even babies, sexual abuse of babies in organized gangs of ghastly pedophilia. Or multiple beheadings by uh, the army of the Islamic State and so on. Can we deny the reality of the power of evil and the capacity for sheer wickedness in the human heart? Can any merely materialistic explanation really suffice? Well, the Bible says no. We can't. The Bible says evil is a reality. And the truth behind all the wickedness in our world is ultimately a dark, malevolent force the Bible calls Satan. It's not just Luke's idea here in verse 3. Jesus himself is plain in verse 31 talking about Satan. And in fact, the whole Bible tells exactly the same story since the very first rebellion of man deceived by the devil. That is the power that lies at the root of all that is wrong in this human world of ours. And that's why, of course, human beings can't fix this world of ours. Not with our best efforts in economy, economics and science and politics or anything else. That's why we can't fix the world. Because this world has a problem that transcends the physical. Because humanity has fallen under a great deception of the evil one. And this whole world is beholden to him. And it's under his power. Jesus calls it the power of darkness. And it's a destructive power, a disintegrative power. Let's go back and read in Luke chapter 8 for a vivid picture of the, the destruction, the disintegration that Satan's power always wreaks in a human life in that story of the Gadarene demoniac. It's a parable of the whole of humanity. And that is the reality of the human condition according to the Bible, according to Jesus. And let me say, if you go home today and just spend five minutes on Google on the internet, you'll find plenty of evidence to back that up. But notice here what the chief manifestation of that evil is in the life of human beings. It's manifest in the burning desire to destroy God himself in the person of the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ. The chief mark of demon possession is not pedophiles and rapists and, uh, 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 and sadists. The chief mark of demon possession is wanting to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the true aim of the evil one is the destruction of God himself and the destruction of all things related to God's kingdom. And notice who Satan's chief accomplices are here. It's those within the official religious establishment who use the name of God, who talk about God, who seem no doubt to many to be very godly, but they want to silence and destroy the real Jesus Christ. Because the real God that he revealed in ultimate clarity and truth, they discovered was a God they didn't like and they didn't want. And Judas, verse 3, one of the twelve, one of Jesus' closest insiders. And yet he became a servant, a tool of the devil himself. Verse 5 says, for money. That's a giveaway John tells us in John 12 in his gospel that Judas was covetous, that he used to steal from the common purse. He wanted to see what Jesus could give him, what he desired for his fulfillment. But the real Jesus turned out to be quite different from the Jesus that Judas wanted. And so to preserve the kind of Christ that he wanted, he turned to destroy the Christ who was real. And of course, Judas is far from unique in that, isn't he? 
you remember back in Luke chapter 8, Jesus told the parable of the sower and said exactly that, that some would be led away by the evil one by the lure of riches and pleasures in life. And that is so often the case, isn't it? For some, it is the love of money that causes people to kill off the real Jesus in their life, to replace him with a pretend Jesus, a puppet Jesus, who's very different, lets you do what you want. For some, it's other desires. Often, it's sexual fulfillment, perhaps, in the way that the real Jesus won't allow. And so we silence him, and we want to invent a new Jesus, in our image, to our liking, who says, yes, that's fine. But maybe Luke wants us to be shocked by these words here. So that even if we think we're real insiders with Jesus, we ask ourselves, if we really hate what Jesus actually stands for, if we resist his way, if we're, if we're disappointed with him and want to remodel him in a different way, to silence his true words and make him say something rather different, then we're also showing that we hate him, aren't we? Be careful, Luke's saying, be careful lest Satan is deceiving you to destroy you. The presence of Satan is real. But of course, what Luke wants us to see above all is that Christ's sovereignty is supreme. And verses 7 to 13 show us that, that nothing can stop the determined plan of God. It is under his total control. Every detail, even down to apparently random matters like jar carrying men, it's all according to plan. It's all according to Jesus' word. Indeed, not just in the midst uh, of Satan's worst assault, but through it and even because of it, God's great victory is being played out. So that in Satan's apparent victory, was the utter defeat of all dark powers. There's a sense of serenity, isn't there, of almost effortless inevitability about these verses, showing how the, the, the disciples went and prepared for the Passover in the face of all that devilish opposition. Because God's sovereignty is supreme. It cannot be assaulted, even by the darkest powers of hell. The powers of evil were successful in their effort, because they did put Christ to death. But their victory became their defeat. And his defeat became his triumph. And the means by which he triumphed. Hebrews 2 puts it this way. By death he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. As one of our hymns says. The very spear that pierced his side drew forth the blood to save. How can that be? Well, the answer, of course, lies in the very heart of this passage in verses 14 to 23, where Luke's focus is unmistakable. It's on the Passover, the real Passover sacrifice, and Christ's suffering for his people. Jesus himself explains that it will be the death of the Savior for his people that brings deliverance from Satan. And release from the bondage to sin and death. Just as the Passover lamb brought redemption from the bondage of Egypt. And constituted God's covenant people as his own chosen ones. Bound for the promised land through that great exodus out of Egypt. Now note first just how precise the timing of Jesus' coming death is. Jesus says... In verse 22, he goes to his death as it is determined. That is by God and the scriptures, and not least by the place of the Passover. Look at all the times it's referred to. Verse 1, the Passover draws near. Nearly every verse from verse 7 talks about it. The Passover lamb must be sacrificed. Verse 8, they went to prepare the Passover. Verse 11, to eat the Passover. Verse 6 tells us that the enemies want to do away with Jesus, away from the crowd. In fact, in Matthew 26, in his account, we're told that they explicitly said, not during the feast, but God's sovereign will and purpose has determined that it must be in the midst of the Passover. It's while eating the Passover that Jesus takes the elements of the meal and explains the full significance of his coming death on the cross. In terms of the institution of a new covenant, the everlasting covenant that the prophets had longed for. 
Because the whole point is that Jesus' death is the ultimate fulfillment of everything that the Passover signified. The Passover, of course, remembered a real event in history, the great exodus that constituted Israel as a nation that brought them out of bondage into the promised land. It begins in Exodus chapter 12. And God says to them, this month of the Passover will be the first of months for you. It's a total new beginning, a new calendar. When the blood of the Passover lamb sheltered them from God's judgment on Egypt and brought them redemption and freedom. And it ends in Exodus chapter 24 up on Sinai where again the blood of the covenant binds this chosen people to God himself to live under his rule with them uh, as his people. But of course the yearly celebration of Passover looked not just back to all of that but it looked forward to the great deliverance that was still to come to the great redemption the ultimate deliverance through the Messiah, the deliverance from the bondage of sin, the establishment of an everlasting covenant of peace, the world to come, where all God's people's sins would be put away forever and a new life, a new beginning would be forever. That was the new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of that would be everlasting, where his people would be made new and clean. The whole heavens and the earth would be renewed. The curse of sin would be banished forever and so every year you see the Passover feast was like a visible tangible prophecy looking for fulfillment well look Jesus death is going to fulfill that Passover hope that's what Jesus is saying here in these verses here is the real Passover fulfilled here is the great exodus begun at last do you remember back in Luke chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appear in glory with Jesus? They spoke to him about the great departure, the great literally exodus that he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. And you just can't miss here the heavy, heavy allusions to Jesus fulfilling the Passover. Verse 7, as I've said, the Passover lamb must be sacrificed. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover, eat this Pascha, before I suffer, before I Pasco. It's not just illusions, though. Jesus explicitly uses the language of fulfillment in verse 16. I won't eat it again because it's being fulfilled. The promised kingdom of God is arriving. Again in verse 18, he won't drink again until the kingdom of God comes. That day is now dawning, he says, long promised. This is the last prophetic Passover foreshadowing the great coming redemption because that redemption is come. Jesus' death fulfills the Passover. And his Passover is explicitly framed as a sacrifice that delivers from sin. That's absolutely evident in all Jesus' talk about the new covenant. If you read Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah talks about that, you'll see it's all about the forgiveness of sin and iniquity. And Jesus' words here in verses 19 to 21 inaugurate a new ordinance filled with new significance that, that supersedes the Passover. He speaks in explicitly sacrificial terms. His body and blood is given for his people. Given is the language of offering, given to the priest. For you is the language in the Old Testament of the sin offerings and the guilt offerings of given in the place of the sinner. This cup, says Jesus, poured out for you, explicitly refers to Isaiah's suffering servant in Isaiah 53, whose life would be poured out to death to bear the sins of many. The new covenant in my blood speaks not only of Exodus 24 and that blood of the covenant that gave new life to Israel, but of course it speaks of Jeremiah's new covenant where sins are no more, where therefore there will be forgiveness that is lasting and life that is everlasting. It's absolutely unmistakable. This is the heart of the New Testament faith. And Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And Peter says we have been ransomed, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb 
without blemish, and so set apart as holy for obedience and sprinkling with the blood of Jesus. This is the beginning of a new calendar, of a new life, of a new age. It's not just forgiveness of sin and the removal of guilt and removal from uh, sin's power and bondage and slavery to Satan. It's a new birth into a living hope of new life restored in communion with God forever. This is the restoration of the true destiny of man. It's the beginning of a whole new order of creation. It's as big as that. And that's what Jesus is proclaiming here in the midst of the darkness and the tragedy of the human condition, which could hardly be more starkly emphasized than by the presence of Judas right there, verse 21. The betrayer's hand is on the table with him, epitomizing the reality of what sin really and truly is. <coughs> revolt against God as he truly is and as he makes himself known to us in Jesus Christ. Rejection of his rule and arrogant insistence on our own self-rule. Denial of God's divine rights over us. And so a determination to banish him, to silence him and to kill him. That's the root of of sin. But look what Jesus says. Woe to the one who thinks and acts in that way. John tells us in his gospel that at this point Judas went out and left them. In the fateful words, Judas went out and it was night. And you see, to go that way is to, to cast yourself into utter darkness outside of the shelter of Christ's Passover, where there is no hope and no salvation, only the assured certainty of judgment. Don't be deceived, Jesus is saying. But Jesus does offer a way out of that sin and sickness and brokenness in fellowship with him, a way that can transform everything that we are by nature, which is just like Judas, which is why all the disciples were asking themselves, which one of us could do this? Any one of us could do this. He offers us a way out of that and a way in to a new life, no longer held by the darkness and bondage of sin, and a share in the greatness of the Son of God himself, the servant king. And you see, that's what verses 24 to 38, lay out for us the real pattern of service and Christ's sustaining of his own. The life of the servant king who will be in his people through the new covenant will work greatness in his own people as we too are crucified with him. And our pride is humbled by the cross, the cross which works real penitence in us even as Satan's ongoing assaults work real perseverance in us through the sustaining intercession of the Savior himself. See, verse 24 makes the point that by nature all the disciples are just the same. They're all just like Judas. Indeed, all humans are. Full of self, you see? Self-assertion, self-aggrandizement, self-belief. That's our world. We recognize it so clearly. Verse 25, don't we? Those who can lord it over others and extract what they can from them. In a dictatorship, you impose it. In a democracy, you just try and get it from the ballot box, voting for whoever's going to give you the best deal. But you see, the power of the cross of Jesus brings deliverance from that self-centered self-rule. It brings a new beginning. Not so with you, says Jesus, verse 26. Notice all the way through these verses, the emphasis on you. He's, he's speaking to those who will be his people, redeemed by his blood into the kingdom of his everlasting covenant. The Passover delivers from bondage into a whole new world, a different world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, because of Christ's Passover deliverance, we've left the dead leaven of the old life, the malice and the evil, for the new way of sincerity and truth. And Peter says we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from the futility 
of life before. And we're born again through the living and abiding word into a life of purity of heart and sincerity of love. And that's what Jesus describes here in verses 26 to 30. A new life of true greatness seen in his everlasting kingdom. Verse 30, eating and drinking at his table and therefore exhibiting the greatness of the one who shows his true greatness by humble service of others. What an upside-down kingdom that seems to be to us, doesn't it? How utterly different from our idea of lordship in the world. I am among you, he says, as one who serves, the great king. But isn't it, in fact, our human world that actually is the upside-down world? How different would our world be if the kings and rulers of our world acted like this? How different what's playing out in the Middle East in our newspapers today would be? Now, Jesus, of course, is speaking here directly to his apostles who have a unique place. And verse 30 there about judging the, the tribes of Israel, that's something unique to them. But Jesus talks this way so often for all his followers, that it's clear that the way of true greatness is to be the norm for all who belong to his kingdom. Verse 26, the way of true greatness is to serve. The way of true honor in his kingdom is utter humility. And yet all are so weak. See, the disciples by nature are just like the world. And they're also vulnerable. Verse 31, you see the you there is plural. He tells us that Satan assaults all of them. Satan demanded to have you all to sift you like wheat, to shake you out, to take you apart, to take you down. Even Peter, the leader of the band. Now, Peter is no sap. Peter knows it's going to be hard to stand with Jesus. He says that in verse 33. He's ready for prison and for death. And Peter was brave. If you look down to verse 50, when they came to attack Jesus, John's gospel tells it was Peter who drew that sword and attacked one of them. Although Jesus rebuked him then as well, as we'll see. But Peter didn't really understand his true depth of weakness. And he would crumple under the psychological pressure of having to stand with Jesus, apparently against all the opinion of the world around him. And that's so true to life, isn't it? Sometimes people are extraordinarily brave in one circumstance and utterly crumple in another one. It must have been so hard, mustn't it, for Peter to hear those words in verse 34, so deflating, so insulting even. But Peter must be made to face up to that devastating truth and to the truth of what Jesus meant in verse 32 that he would come through, but not through anything at all in, in himself, but only through what Jesus would do for him. Peter's own pride would let him down utterly, but Jesus' prayers would not fail him. And that alone would keep his faith from failure, from utter collapse. Jesus' prayer, Jesus' intercession, it's not something different uh, from his redeeming work as a savior from sin, as a deliverer. It's just the personal application of that work through his effectual call to true faith in somebody's heart. He grants Peter true faith that will not fail through the blood shed in his mercy extended to him personally and truly. And notice, it is his sovereign choice and will to do that. Look at verse 29. I assign to you, literally, I covenant to you, to those who are my own, I covenant a kingdom, the blessing of the new covenant. And verse 32, I have prayed for you. It is a sovereign act of God, and yet it will not be apart from faith in Peter. And true faith always involves true faith penitence, the death of all pride. You see, verse 32 speaks of Peter turning, repenting. He must repent of his weakness and his sin. But he will and he can because Christ's blood intervenes before the throne of God, interceding for him to sustain him 
and to keep him in God's great mercy. That's Christ's sovereign saving prayer for his own. We sang it. His blood pleads peace for us, and by that power his saints forever by grace shall stand. But it's so often so, isn't it, that it's only when we're forced to see our own great weakness, our real weakness, indeed our real wickedness, often through some great humbling in our life, so often it's only then that we see our great need, our need for Jesus, our need for his cross as our only hope in life and death. When we realize that there's no hope at all in our own life, in our own pride, but only in his and in his prayer for us. How many, many people over the years, especially great ones, have only ever come to faith in Christ through some great humbling in their lives, some great humiliation. And yet, you see, even in that, again, where Satan intends evil to damage, to destroy, God means it for good. Even Peter's great failure will in the end become a means of strengthening his Christian brothers. That's what Jesus says in verse 32. When you have turned, strengthen your brothers. The pain of Peter's sin becomes the power of Peter's strengthening ministry through his wonderful experience of God's forgiveness and God's great mercy. And Peter did become a great leader, a great servant of Christ. It's Peter in his letter who writes of God's great mercy that has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's Peter in those letters who writes with such tenderness, with such understanding to beleaguered Christians around the Roman Empire, scattered, to encourage them, to strengthen them. And sometimes it is those who have known what it's like to fall so terribly badly, who can help others, who can strengthen others the most because they know what it is to have been humbled by their sins, but also lifted and restored by the God of all grace and comfort, the God who restores and comforts and strengthens and establishes even such as them. So deep and so wide is his great mercy. Maybe that is an encouragement for somebody this morning smarting under the shame of knowing that you failed the Lord Jesus terribly badly. If that's you take hold of Jesus' words here this morning and when you have returned, when you have repented and received his forgiveness, strengthen your brothers and sisters with your renewed joy at the great mercy of God in Christ. The sustaining prayer of the Son of God will use even the ongoing humbling of our own sin to shape us into true servants of his kingdom. Humbling us to see more and more our need of mercy and the cost of mercy by his precious blood so that we love mercy and so that we show mercy and walk humbly, which Jesus says is the way of greatness in his eternal world. And to that end also, he will use the ongoing hostility of Satan towards his own, because that is the call of, king, of the kingdom, and Jesus makes that clear in that last paragraph. Prepare for opposition is what he's saying, for hostility, for battles. It's unmistakable. Jesus is a king who has been rejected by even his own people, and we can't expect the world, therefore, to welcome and provide for his people. If Jesus was considered an outcast, a transgressor, as Isaiah the prophet promised he would, despised, rejected, then so it will be for those who follow him. They'll have to provide for themselves in a hostile world and be prepared for attack, even violent assault, and protect themselves. Although, of course, Jesus is certainly not telling his followers to attack anyone else with a sword in his name. That's enough, he says in verse 38, when they think that that's what he's saying. And you'll see it even clearer down in verse 51 when they actually do take up their swords. No more of that, says Jesus. But what he is saying is be real. The real pattern of service in my kingdom will be so foreign to this world that this world will hate you and will oppose you 
and we'll even assault you. That's been the history of the Christian church through 20 centuries. It's the story of the Christian church in the majority of the world today. What we have lived through in our lifetimes here in the West is an anomaly. Although perhaps that's changing. But there are some here who have known that real and present physical hostility in other places. But friends, if that makes us tremble, Luke surely writes these things to say to us, fear not. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. We have been ransomed by his precious blood, and he has covenanted to us the kingdom that he has received from his heavenly Father, the everlasting kingdom of life. And so if you belong to Jesus, then he says to you just what he says to Peter. Satan demanded to have you, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Yes, we will know the humbling because of our own sin. And yes, we will know the relentless hostility of Satan. But what he means for evil, God has determined for good for those who are his own. He's sovereign over all. And he has suffered for his people so that he will sustain them to the end. So the message is trust him and follow him. And you also will find it just as he has told you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the stark realism of your word. It hides nothing from us of the truth and reality that we can see and hear with our own eyes and ears of what this world is truly like. It hides nothing in the small print pretending that to follow Jesus is nothing less than a holiday. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the truth. But in that truth, you give us great abiding hope. And so we pray that you would help us, even as your blood continues to intercede for your own, that though assailed by the evil one, and though often floored by our own weakness and sin, we would prevail through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Savior alone, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to end this morning hymn number 297, a great hymn of triumph and praise. Hallelujah, raise the anthem, let the skies resound with praise, sing to Christ who paid our ransom, wonderful his works and ways. Number 297.
so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.